Hare Krishna Maharaj. I think we can start Maharaj. Okay, yeah, we need uh, the verse on the board. Okay, I'm just trying to bring that up now. And then we need somebody who can read really clearly to read the uh, purport. Okay, now. Mm. <laughs> I'll read the translation and the Sanskrit when you just need somebody to do the purport. Okay. We have it now, my right. We have the the test this I want me to is here you want you want to already sharing the, the verse my right okay you need to put the full screen on there. Mm -hmm. I'm actually I'm using my phone. I'm not with my computer. But that's not the verse. Uh, it's one it's, one seven one seven five. Oh, sorry. Mm -hmm. One seven five. I'm sorry, my right. So one, one, two, seven, that's five. Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prasthaya Bhutale. Turn on your, uh, you have to turn on the recording too for the class. What? All right. You need to record this too, sir. So turn on the recording button. Yeah. Uh, it's on, it's on, okay. One minute. There is a feature on uh, on Zoom where you can. Okay, it's on now. It's on. Uh, it's on live on uh, uh on uh, YouTube also. Okay, good. Hi, I'm Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prasthaya Bhutale Shri Bhakti Vedanta Swami Ti Namine Namaste Saraswati Deve. Goravani Pachari Nene Vishesha Sunya Mahari Somebody has their uh, microphone on and is chanting Japa, so it's coming through. It's mm -hmm. Okay. You can mute everybody. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Yaya Sammohitam Jiva Atmanam Sri Gunatmakam 
Ropi manute nartam tatkritam cha vipadyate. Translation. Due to the external energy, the living entity, although transcendental to the three modes of material nature, thinks him of himself as a material product and thus under the reactions of material miseries. And then we need a nice, dear reader, someone who reads nicely and can read clearly. You, 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 you want me to read Maharaj? Uh, anybody who is good at reading. Okay, I can try. Or I can find someone in the group that can read if you want. Okay. Oh, you can find Maharaj. Yeah. Okay. Um, Sri Devi, are you there? Yes, Guru Maharaj, my humble obeisances to you, all the Vaishnavas, all glories to Prabhupada, all glories to your divine lotus feet. Read the purport. Yes, Guru Maharaj. Purport by his divine grace, Prabhupada. The root cause of suffering by the materialistic living beings is pointed out with remedial measures which are to be undertaken and also the ultimate perfection to be gained. All this is mentioned in this particular verse. The living being is by constitution transcendental to the material engagement, but is now imprisoned by the external energy and therefore he thinks himself one of the material products. And due to this unholy contact, the pure spiritual entity suffers material miseries under the modes of material nature. The, li the living entity misunderstands himself to be a material product. This means that the present perverted way of thinking, feeling, and willing under material conditions is not natural for him. But he has his normal way of thinking, feeling, and willing. The living being in his original state is not without thinking, feeling, willing, and feeling power. It is also confirmed in the Bhagavad Gita that the actual knowledge of the conditioned soul is now covered by nescience. The theory that a living being is Absolute impersonal Brahman is refuted herein. This cannot be because the living entity has his own way of thinking in his original unconditional state also. The present conditional state is due to the influence of the external energy, which means that the illusory energy takes the initiative. While the Supreme Lord is aloof, the Lord does not desire that a living being be illusioned by external energy. The external energy is aware of this fact, but still she accepts a thankless task of keeping the forgotten soul under illusion by her bewildering influence. The Lord does not interfere with the task of the illusory energy because such performances of the illusory energy are also necessary for reformation of the condition. So, an affectionate father does not like his children to be chastised by another agent. Yet, he puts his disobedient children under the custody of a severe man just to bring them to order. But the affectionate or father at the same time desires relief for the conditioned soul, relief for the clutches of the illusory energy. The 
helps the disobedient citizens within the walls of the jail. But sometimes the king desires prisoner relief. Personally goes there and pleads for reformation. And on his doing so, the prisoners are set free. Similarly, the Supreme Lord descends from his kingdom upon the kingdom of the illusory energy and personally gives relief in the form of the Bhagavad Gita, where, wherein he personally suggests that although the ways of the illusory energy are very stiff to overcome, one who surrenders unto the lotus feet of the Lord is set free by the order of the Supreme. This surrendering process is the remedial measure for getting relief from the, bewild place, India? From the bewildering ways of the illusory energy. What are you doing there? Okay, you come pick something. This this rendering process is a remedial measure for getting relief from the bewildering ways of the illusory energy. The surrendering process is completed by the influence of association. The Lord suggested, therefore, that by the influence of the speeches of saintly persons who have actually realized the Supreme. Conditioned souls are engaged in his transcendental loving service. They get a taste for hearing about the Lord, and by such hearing only are they gradually elevated to the surrender. Well, by the surrendering process. Yeah, by the surrendering process. Surrendering process. Okay, herein also the same suggestion is made by the Lord in his incarnation of Yasadev. This means that the conditioned souls are being reclaimed by the Lord both ways, namely by the process of punishment, by the external energy of the Lord, and by himself as a spiritual master within and without. Within of every living being, the Lord himself as the super soul, Paramatma, becomes the spiritual master, and from without, he becomes the spiritual master in the shape of scriptures, saints, and the initiator spiritual master. This is still more explicitly explained in the next shloka. Personal superintendence of the illusory energy is confirmed in the Vedas, the Kena Upanishad, in relation to the demigods' controlling power. Here also it is clearly stated that the living entity is controlled by the external energy in a personal capacity. The living being thus subject to the control of the external energy is differently situated. It is clear, however, from the present statement of the Bhagavatam that the same external energy is situated in the inferior position before the personality of Godhead or the perfect being. The perfect being or the Lord cannot be approached even by the illusory energy who can only work on the living entities. Therefore, it is sheer imagination that the Supreme Lord is illusioned by the illusory energy and thus becomes a living being. If the being and the Lord were in the same category, then it would have been quite possible for Vyasadeva to see it, and there would have been no question of material this on the part of the human being, for the Supreme Being is fully cognizant. So many unscrupulous imaginations on the part of the monists to endeavor to put both the Lord and the living being in the same category. Had the Lord and the living beings been the same, then Srila Shukadev Goswami would not have taken the trouble to describe the transcendental past as the Lord for the, all the manifestations of the illusory energy. Bhagavatam is the sumam bonum remedy for suffering humanity in the clutches of Maya. Vyasadeva, therefore, first of all diagnosed the actual disease of the conditioned soul, that is, they are being illusioned by the external energy. He also saw the perfect supreme being from, who, from whom the illusory energy is far removed. So he saw both the deceased conditioned souls and also the cause of the disease. 
and the remedial measures are suggested in the next verse. Both the personality of Godhead and the living beings are undoubtedly quality one, but the Lord is the controller of the illusory energy, whereas the living entity is controlled by the illusory energy. Thus, the Lord and the living beings are simultaneously one and different. Another point is distinct herein, that eternal relation between the Lord and the living being is transcendental. Otherwise, the Lord could not have taken the trouble to reclaim the conditioned souls from the clutches of Maya. In the same way, the living entity is also required to revive his natural love and affection for the Lord. And that is the highest perfection of the living entity. Sri Matam treats the conditioned soul with an aim to that goal of life. Thank you. Sri Prabhupada Kijai. Hmm. So this verse covers many similar points related to the re relationship between the Lord, the living entity, and the external energy of the Lord. The external energy of the Lord is called the Maya. It's called the illusionary energy. Illusionary means that it presents itself in one way, but what it gives itself a different result. In other words, the illusionary energy is always in a situation to cause a living entity to forget Krishna and to think that they could enjoy through the features of the sense objects which present themselves as part of the illusionary energy's way of trapping the living entity. So here, and it says here that Krishna allows this illusionary energy to work in such a way in order for correction. So Maya, another name for Maya is mercy. And that's given in the Bhagavatam. And one of the definitions of mercy is that she helps one to cause one to leave her association and take shelter of the Lord. By the school of difficulty. In other words, she creates difficulty in the life of the living entity who is trying to enjoy her. She's like a she's like a woman who presents herself to be enjoyed, but at the same time is simply trying to attract people and at the same time giving no enjoyment at all. So therefore the living entity remains frustrated. And then, they, and then the living entity thinks mistakenly that by adjusting the material energy, one can free themselves from the suffering that the material energy presents. But this adjustment is, causes another form of suffering because the material energy, although variegated in its presentation, has an underlying principle of causing disappointment and ultimately suffering to the living entity. No matter how the living entity presents the, living, the illusionary energy, it always has the same results, that one cannot enjoy it, therefore one suffers in different ways and one becomes morose, despondent. So here, um, but at the same time, the Lord He's aware of how the illusionary energy is working on the conditioned soul. And therefore, he's very compassionate. Prabhupada says in the purport, the Lord would not have made, gone to so much trouble to reclaim the living entity from the suffering of material energy if there wasn't an eternal relationship between the living entity and the Lord. So that is the foundation for which we connect to the Lord, that we have an eternal relationship with the Lord. And the relationship with the Lord is fundamental to all forms of relationship. It's based on service. 
So there is this, the one who is served and the one who is, one who is being served and the one who is serving. So the living entities are meant to serve. So if we're not serving the Supreme Lord, we're serving the external energy. And serving a bad master means one doesn't get any benefit from that service and just wastes their time and energy. Therefore, the Lord tries to attract the living entity to serve him through two ways, as it's mentioned here, through frustrating our service in our attempts to enjoy the material energy, and in the other way, by sending his bona fide spiritual master to reclaim the living entity by giving him, by giving them service to the Lord, by guiding them through knowledge based on the teachings of the Lord coming through scripture. And of course, Prabhupada adds, and by the grace of the Acharyas or the saints that have gone before. But the living entity remains stubborn and doesn't want to serve the Lord, despite the Lord's entreating in different ways. And therefore the living entity still is under this false idea that it can become happy or fulfill its desire to become happy through the external energy. And as that struggle continues to go on, the living entity becomes more and more frustrated and takes to more and more wrong activities. Uh, even if they fail to enjoy in a nice way, they may try to enjoy in a way that is not allowed by morality, civility, or even scripture itself. In other words, they get into the activities of sinful life. And one of the main ways that people do that is through intoxication. Intoxication has been a way that people want to relieve the form of their suffering. So they go into this another state of consciousness brought about by some kind of illegal substances, either drugs, alcohol, or even absorbing themselves in, in the media, such as television and all kinds of electronic devices, just to bury their consciousness away from the sufferings that they experience. But this is like adding suffering to suffering. Uh, if you, if a person in, has drunk some bad liquid and is looking for relief and they grab the bottle, the same bottle that caused them the suffering in the first place, it just it compounds their suffering. So in the same way, the living entity doesn't see outside of its own limited scope of choosing. It chooses another form of material life to counteract the sufferings in one form. Therefore, there's only one solution, and that is to take to the service of the Lord with a desire to please the Lord by such service. And when the living entity becomes fixed in that, then the effects of the material energy start to slacken. In other words, the chains and the, uh, the hardships that one is struggling with gradually become less and less. And finally, after one point, they are fully gone by absorption in service to the Lord. And that absorption takes the form of glorification of the Lord. So out of all the forms of devotional practice, the most effective and direct is to glorify the Lord his name, his qualities, his pastimes, his devotees. These are all objects of glorification. And when the living entity focuses on glorifying the Lord in these ways, then the, the illusionary energy not only stops putting the pressure on, but they actually it assists Maya becomes a friend 
and helps the living entity in their service to the Lord. Then it's no longer the same Maya, just like, um, you know, a police officer is a, to a, a nice citizen is a good friend, but to a criminal he is uh, fear personified. So in the same way, although the, the material energy is the same, she treats the living entity according to how they do direct their attention towards the Lord. And that's her job. She has to cause us some difficulty until we actually wake up, <laughs> you might say, and stop trying to enjoy the illusionary energy and take to devotional service. And the essence of that devotional service, as we mentioned, is to hear and chant the glories of the Lord. And that comes in the form of sadhana. And so the devotee, many times the devotee will become, what we say, aware how important it is to serve the Lord and begin an, e an effort to serve the Lord. But because their determination is not strong or because the effects of their attachment to the material energy is still very much influential, they can't stay steady in devotional service. They go in and out and they still look again to the material energy for some kind of relief or some kind of uh, happiness. But that is because they haven't fully understood the power of devotional service. And therefore, if they stay steady in their sadhana, because sadhana means the process. Sadhana means the process. That's what the actual word sadhana means, the process. The process of moving ourselves from one stage of devotion to the higher, the next higher stage. And that comes, that specifically comes, the essence of that is to glorify the Lord through the chanting of the Hare Krishna Hamaha Mantra. So we have the tool right in front of us and it's easily available. And that is to chant the holy names of the Lord. But we fall into the category of thinking, well, yes, I chant, I chant my 16 rounds and that's what I do. But that is not our philosophy. 16 rounds, if you, we understand the 16 rounds means that which gets you started to help you develop a taste for chanting. And this is explained by Srila Prabhupada, which he comments on Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur's statement that by chanting every day, one will begin to chant always. So our 16 rounds are meant as a springboard to help us develop a taste for chanting where we actually start, we actually chant more and more and more. And then we can start to understand the happiness of Krishna consciousness and taste that happiness continuously through extended chanting and hearing the glories of the Lord. So in this particular time period we're in, where we are finding ourselves having more personal time due to maybe some of the external activities that we were involved in are no longer available or no longer necessary. We might have more time now for hearing and chanting the glories of the Lord. Instead of looking this way and that way to find some activity of the senses, just pick up the beads and start chanting. And just chant. Uh, it's been recommended by the Acharyas that sometimes you can set a whole day aside. You can begin at midnight and chant to the, to the next midnight, 24 hours complete japa. You might think, well, I can't do that, it's too hard. But you should try to increase your rounds more and more like that. And that way, we'll start to understand what 
the scriptures say that this this process of Krishna consciousness is unlimitedly joyful. It comes and it's the ba it's based on hearing and chanting Krishna's holy name more and more because the power of the holy name has been given extra facility in this age by Lord Chaitanya, who personally brought the holy name along with himself as the incarnation in this age of darkness. Darkness in the sense that there is so much, uh, so much negativity coming from the external energy. And therefore it is only increasing. And as Srila Prabhupada has warned us, he says as Kali Yuga progresses, the demons will become more and the material energy will become more and more oppressive. So therefore a devotee becomes, oh, well, where do I go? Well, we got here, we have the means to take shelter of Krishna in the form of the holy name. And as it's understood, when one is chanting the holy name, they are on the liberated platform and cannot be touched by the effects of the material energy, no matter how strong that material energy may appear to be. The, the, the holy name is so strong and so powerful that it can protect anyone in any situation from even the most dangerous material situation. And that is explained and also been demonstrated throughout history. So yeah, so this is how we get the mercy of the Lord. And then as our holy name increases and we start getting a taste, then we start thinking, oh, I'd like to serve this way. I'd like to serve that way. In other words, our inspiration for service starts to increase. And though the material energy is still in our purview, it has no effect. It's like when you're outside in a rain storm, it may be raining very hard, but you have your umbrella and you have your rain clothes and you remain completely dry. Although the rain is all around. So in the same way, the material energy will still be within the purview of our existence, but unable to touch us as long as we stay fixed in chanting the holy names and engaged in devotional service. Okay, so I'll stop there and we'll open it up for discussion. Thank you very much, Mara. So any of the board who wants to have questions, please you can raise your hand and you can omit yourself and ask Maharaj. Okay. You're in Ghana? I'm in Nigeria, Maharaj. Nigeria, oh, okay. <laughs> yes, Maharaj. Thank you for coming, Maharaj. Hare Krishna. Jai Ho. Yes, Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Go Matsya. Hare Krishna, Maharaj. My humble obeisance is glorious to Shila Prabhupada. Thank you very much for a fantastic class, actually. I take it personally and uh, quite instructive for, uh, for me and my own situation. Uh, there was a... Um, there was, um, um, a very nice point at the end that um, is still uh, resonating within me um, about the uh, potency of the holy name and it will give protection no matter what. But uh, makes me wonder, um, from what I know, there shouldn't be any offenses in that chanting. Can you, can you please uh, elaborate a little bit more about in, in that regard? What what is the effect um, when chanting with offenses and how to raise above? I mean, it's an it's a, um, eternal topic, I guess, and it's um, never enough to hear about it. So please, if, you, if you'd like to say more about this. Yeah. From, that, yeah. from that point, that the Holy Name gives protection in any situation. Thank you. Yeah. Srila Bhakti Vinod Thakur explains that we should emphasize attention as the main concern or the main focus when we're chanting. And so one should 
make a determined effort to chant with attention. Despite the fact that one may fail at different times and find themselves you know, struggling with that, one should not give up the struggle, but one should continue to try to bring about attention. And Bhaktivinoda Thakur says, by chanting with attention, it's very unlikely, in fact, it is unlikely, you will commit offenses or you'll be chanting with offense. We chant when the fence, when we're inattentive. And so that inattention brings about opportunities for other forms of offenses. So this is where he says, this is where you should put your emphasis on attentive chanting. And you have to work on it. The mind will go this way and that way, but then as Krishna says in the Gita, wherever it goes, bring it back. And where do you bring it? Under back to the sound of the of your chanting of the holy name. So um, if you are, you know, job is not for lazy people. It's not a lazy man's business. It's someone that you have to work on it <laughs> to, to improve it, to perfect it. It takes effort, it takes time, it takes energy, and it also takes some understanding of, of how to chant attentively and avoid this uh, inattention, laziness, lackadaisicalness, sleepiness that all comes, may or may come when we begin our chanting the holy name. We have to work on it. It's a struggle. But it's a struggle that brings good results. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mara. Any other devotees want to ask a question, please? Uh, yes, please. Uh, I would like to ask Prabhu, if you don't mind. Please, go ahead, Mataji. Thank you. Uh, Guru Mara, thank you for this wonderful lecture. In the lecture, you mentioned that when one is chanting, one is on the liberated platform and material energy cannot touch you. So does this happen only when we reach uh, Shuddhanam, pure chanting, or it is at any stage of chanting? Uh, there's different different levels of that. For chanting mm, with a fence, still there is some protection, but not complete. In other words, if you're chanting with a fence, you can't fully understand how the, the holy name is actually giving you that protection. And at the same time, you're not, because you're not focused properly, you still become affected by what's happening in the environment. But one who one who is chanting attentively, then uh, to chant attentively, we have to be at least free from most of the offenses of the holy name. <clears throat> To get to Sudanam is, if you're chanting on Namabas, Namabas means a glimmer of the holy name. That is enough to give you complete protection. <laughs> the three sages, Nam, Namaparad, Namabas, and uh, Sudanam, if you can get to the stage of Namabas, you're, okay, you're, you're fixed. Mm -hmm. And the characteristics of Namabhas are explained very clearly in Madhurya Kandambini by Vishwana Chakravarti Thakur, he, des he describes that. Yeah, Thank you, Guru Maharaj. Thank you, Prabhu. Thank you very much.
Hare Krishna Maharaj, please accept my humble obeisances. All glories to Srila Prabhupada, all glories to you Maharaj. Hari Om. I think there's no any other question, Maharaj. So really appreciate your coming. So thank you very much for enlightening us about the only name. Oh, okay. All right. We can conclude here if that's there's no more questions. I had a yeah. question, Maharaj. Sorry, I thought I was speaking, but then I was speaking to mute. So can I still ask? Sorry about yes, that. Please. Please go ahead. Yeah. Hare Krishna Maharaj, please accept my humble obeisances. Uh, all glories to Srila Prabhupada. Maharaj, I had a question in regards to what you said about the external energy as to how uh, she works for the reformation of the conditioned souls. Um, because when there is uh, no pleasure and when you are baffled in your material attempts or happiness, there is a chance that you would look out for Krishna or for a higher purpose in life. And then there's also a statement in Bhagavad Gita where Krishna says that... Uh, I can't remember the chapter and the verse, but it says that if a devotee or, or if a yogi uh, cannot fulfill uh, his devotional service in this life, then he gets better facilities, either birth in a, in a respectable uh, family uh, or uh, birth in a, in, in a devotee family. Uh, but more often that we find, Maharaj, that if somebody is born in an opulent family, then uh, that they are given a chance to actually progress from the spiritual lives. Uh, because they don't have to worry about food, they don't have to worry about money. Uh, but more often, uh, in fact, in almost all the cases, we see that when those facilities are given, then the living entity gets more and more enrolled and engaged um, into more uh, sense gratification activities. So I'm kind of trying to reconcile this too, that on one end, Maya Devi helps us to reform because only in when you have pain and when you have lots of beatings and sufferings, can you then have a, a good chance to ask about a higher purpose of life. But on the other hand, Krishna also says that he puts us into a better facility uh, to complete our devotional service, where we find that the chance is, is very less because then you get more and more engaged into sense gratification because you're born in an opulent family or, or a family with high parentage. Yeah, that's due to wrong association. Because that Sukriti is there, it is not being feed, it is not being watered by the proper association. Therefore, getting into the wrong association, the material aspect will get get uh, nourished. So, uh, as soon as that the same living entity comes in contact with the devotees of the Lord or the process of devotional service because of their past life, they will come back generally. It's due to association. So they have to be somehow or other fortunate enough to catch devotional association in the present life. Otherwise they're led away generally by the wrong association, which means that uh, their material good fortune becomes an opportunity for more sense gratification. Mm -hmm. And we see that. I've seen that so many times in rich families. But somehow or other, if we, even when these rich families come in contact with spiritual life, uh, they start to blossom. They change. But because of wrong association before that, you know, they go down. All depends on association. And to get that association, that is Krishna's mercy. If somehow or other, he allows them to get that association. Or if they can understand where to get it, then they grow. We have a question in the start chat room, Maharaj. Yeah. Uh, George Omega is asking, Hare Krishna Maharaj, thank you very much for your wonderful lectures. My question is beyond the mind is intelligence and beyond the intelligence is knowledge. 
beyond knowledge is the soul. But how come the soul succumb to the mind so easily? How come, how, how does, what come to the mind so easily? How come the soul succumb to the mind so easily? Mind is very strong and it can overshadow the intelligence. The mind, the mind is more or less in the mode of goodness and the, and the, the uh, intelligence is in the mode of passion and the false ego is in the mode of ignorance. So what happens is the mind connects with the false ego and then be, based on the false ego's uh, desire to enjoy, the mind facilitates that. Not, but the intelligence, if the intelligence is not purified, then there, you're, you're getting no support. So what, what is that purified intelligence then? That is called Shastra Chakshus. One has to see life through scriptural knowledge or see through spiritual eyes and not see through material eyes. So the mind is the cause of us taking birth life after life after life in different situations. The mind is very unruly. The mind is very independent. The mind is very hard to control. And the intelligence is our saving factor. But if this intelligence is not purified by higher knowledge, then the mind will continue to lead us to sense gratification. You'll see, even for devotees who are practicing Krishna consciousness for many years, sometimes their mind just leads them away. That's the nature of the mind. It's so, what we say, independent and so hard to control. Therefore, one has to be, what we say, attentive. The word attentive is very important. Attentive to our spiritual practice. As soon as we are inattentive, the mind takes that opportunity to bring us somewhere into the material energy. So therefore, it says, never trust your mind. If you trust your mind, you're, you're making friends with your possible worst enemy. <laughs> you have to connect that mind to higher intelligence. And that's where there is an effort to do that. That's why we have to know the process of bhakti and know how maya works to bring our mind away. Thank you very much, Maharaj. Uh, we have Sadi Prabhu wants to ask you a question, Maharaj. Okay. Prabhu, please unmute yourself. Hare Krishna, Maharaj. Oh, Sadi, very well. Hare Krishna. Thank you again. Thank you for blessing our platform and blessing us. Um, Maharaj, my understanding is that uh, from Sri Upanishad, it says Krishna is complete, he is supreme pure. Everything about him is pure. Uh, in the purpose, Sri Prabhupada was explaining the root cause of the living entity's suffering. And he was saying that the root cause of the living entity's suffering is as a result of unholy contact with mm -hmm. material nature. So my question is, how does material nature become unholy? Or <laughs> what activities do living entities do within the material nature that makes it unholy? Well, the three modes of material nature comprise the material energy. And therefore they have characteristics that inspire the living entity in three different directions to try to enjoy. Unholy means to try to enjoy something that is not 
meant for our enjoyment or something we can enjoy. Holy means sanctified. Holy means something that is uh, above the material energy. Therefore, the material energy in its definition is considered to be leading one into unholy activities. But the material energy itself is Krishna's energy. So therefore, in one sense, it's divine. But he's Prabhupada's using it from another angle. That's all. He's just giving the other side. <laughs> yeah. Unholy association with the three modes. One or, one or more of the three modes of material nature. Thank you, Maharaj. Very well, Sahadev. How are you? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Your Grace, I'm doing pretty good. Thank you. Good, good, good. Hare Krishna. I was thinking of you, Maharaj, about your uh, prisons outreach. Uh, I, I once visited the prisons for job employment, and I got so scared. <laughs> <laughs> Said I would never step there, but you always go there to preach. <laughs> yeah, uh, that's not. That's. I don't think you would do good there. <laughs> Nataraj Prabhu, you want to ask a question, Nataraj Prabhu? Yes, Prabhuji. Hare Krishna. Please ask Nataraj. You are. Uh -huh. you can ask Maharaj, Hare Krishna Maharaj, all glory to Srila Prabhupada. So, Maharaj, we are hearing of uh, material creation and the spiritual world and uh, the uh, freedom of the living entity. So, I want to know, Maharaj, this freedom of the living entity is this existing only in material world or both in the spiritual world? or which exactly where the living entity have this freedom. Because we know that this place is a prison. Doroga means prison. That means this is the prison house of the Lord. So yeah. now, this uh, living entity freedom, is it in the spiritual world? Is it existing or is it existing also in this material world? Hare Krishna Maharaj. Mm, well, anybody who knows about a prison knows that there's, a limited amount of freedom there. You can go from your cell and you can go out into the yard and do some exercise, <laughs> pick up some weights, maybe run around the yard. I've been to many prisons. I've seen how they, how they operate. So they have a little freedom within the jail. So you can't say that you're free in the jail because the jail is a place for no freedom. So anybody who thinks they're free in the jail and doesn't understand that what is real freedom. Real freedom means to express oneself in different ways, to be able to love, to be able to serve, to be able to express their creativity. None of that is available in the material energy because every time we try these things, we run into obstacles or difficulties. But in the spiritual sense, these are all natural because they're part of the soul's constitution. So on the spiritual platform, there is only freedom. On the material platform, there is only jail. <laughs> because uh, that's why we're in the material world because we left the spiritual world, which is the, the world of freedom, expression, love to come to this material world to try the same thing here but it doesn't work because it this you know it's like trying to it's like trying to uh taste honey by licking the outside of the bottle <laughs> there's no taste so that's that's bhakti siddhanta saraswati's explanation of material happiness that the honey is inside the bottle, but people think, oh, I can see the honey, so let me just lick the bottle. 
doesn't work. So in this material world, we think we're free. We think that we can find happiness, but we have no understanding what real happiness is. Real happiness is unlimited. It's the soul's pure expression of their relationship with the Lord. So everybody's trying to be happy here and nobody's successful. <laughs> Thank you very much, Maharaj. Really appreciate your time, Maharaj. Okay, so, thank you. Thank you very much for coming, Maharaj. So we'd like all the devotees to try to show our appreciation to Maharaj by loudly omit yourself and loudly chanting one power for Hare Krishna Maha Mantra. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Krishna Krishna. Hare Hare. Hare Rama. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Rama. Hare Rama. Hare Rama. Hare Hare. Hare Rama. Hare Rama. Hare Rama. Hare Rama. Hare Hare. Maharaj, we're not chanting wrong today. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna, Guru Maharaj, please accept my humble obeisances. Are we chanting a one round today? Uh, it was, well, this is a different Zoom. This is coming from West Africa, so I'm just simply following there. Okay, okay. That's fine. Program. Thank you. Thank you so much for a lovely class, Maharaj. Thank you. Hare Krishna. Thank you. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna.